Philip Kennedy Johnson and Ricardo Federighi continue the War World saga as Clark begins learning about War World's violent and storied history and culture, discovering the world wasn't always home to the brutal Mongols and once belonged to something else. Philip Kennedy Johnson's War World Saga continues this issue with a part of the story dedicated to exploring the culture and history of War World and what exactly the hellish battle world is. I thoroughly commend Johnson for giving us a section of the story dedicated to the backstory and lore of the place, a place we don't really know all that much about besides some of the usual stuff we know that it belonged to Mongol and it's where he battles people and stuff like that. Because of this sort of mystery past, it's kind of a boon to Johnson since he can come up with a and give us some really awesome Conan the Barbarian, almost Dark Souls like lore dump about the world that is War World and the world that was War World. On top of that, Johnson explores Clark's frame of mind through journal entries, fitting for someone who is a writer by trade. I like Clark being forced to adapt his skills now that he has no powers, and because of it, he's forced to become a warrior and fight, despite not wanting to save War World in this way. It's a great use of the whole rock and a hard place analogy, and it's either fight or die, quite literally. Ricardo Federighi joins the book as its regular artist and my god is his dark sketch like highly detailed artwork suited for this type of story. I thoroughly loved how much visual storytelling his work packs, it's just every page is just filled with all these great little details and being this is a very lore dump heavy issue, we're treated to huge splash pages showcasing just the scale of War World and its inner chambers and it's all just fantastic to look at. Action Comics issue 1039 was another utterly perfect entry in the War World Saga series, giving us a peek into the culture and lore of War World as Superman realises what he must become to free the world from Mongol's wrath. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10. Action Comics issue 1039 finds Clark begin a journal on War World, talking about how he's the son of farmers and scientists, and a husband and a father and a journalist by trade, which is why he's compelled to document his time on the planet. As Omak and Natasha battle some creatures in the ring, an alien creature charges some of the Philogians, but luckily Superman saves them. The hero battles more giant monsters as Clark's journal talks about how he fought for truth and justice on his home, and while some opposed him, some joined him. Other fighters come to Superman's aid, helping him with a creature as he remembers Lois calling people like him champions of the oppressed, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but as he takes the beast down, Clark knows that that type of feat is beyond him now, but the work goes on. Suddenly the hero is electrocuted by the ringmaster, but Omak stops Natasha from helping since they will kill her too. Nat knows that they can't just let him, but Omak doesn't care since why should Clark be treated any differently from them? Later on in the smithy, some of the Philogian notlings act out like they are Mongol. One tells them to be quiet, but they don't listen knowing they would have received iron as well had it not been for Superman getting in their way. The older Philogian knows that the survival is the greater victory as some aliens talk with Omak about how they fought like a war zone, making others fear her when she takes her enemies down. They think she could be of great service to War World but they ask if she serves the Superman but Omak says she never did and they came to War World with one reason and that one reason is dead. Natasha meanwhile is given five iron links, told her to leave some for the rest of the Yellow Warriors but she knows that if they value their iron, they'll stay away from her. She asks Leonath about getting some work with him in the smithy, but the Warzu knows that they will not allow Superman's tribe to work despite Natasha's experience in the forge. Leonath says, however, he will ask the Blood Priest if he can pick out a slave to help be his apprentice since he is short-handed. He asks if it's armor she wants to make, and that says that she wants to make a sword of armor. In the cells, a song sounds out through the cages as Clark is told by Krillux that if if he wants to close his wounds, he will need some blind worms, but he should maybe pick up a weapon in the next fight. Clark says he didn't come there to maim or kill others, but Krill says that neither did they, asking if he thinks that they are barbarians because they wish to survive, asking if Superman feels noble blocking axes with his forehead like a fool. The warrior thinks that Superman has forgotten how to fight like a mortal and he never evades attacks, and when he does block, he does so with his arm or he tries to catch the weapon, and since this place is covered in red sun radiation, he is vulnerable and he will need to learn to use a weapon or die for nothing. 
Clark figures out that Krill used to be a Felosian like the others, but the man doesn't care for that now, since this place is just a preserve for the civilizations that Mongol has destroyed, and those who aren't Warzun are just strays and cannon fodder for Mongol's armies. He does say that he was once Felosian and that he once lived in a sustainable ecosystem that would have lasted forever, and he had a wife and three daughters and a little boy and a home. But then Warworld came and now his family is ashes and his chain is his only legacy. Soon they are all stirred from their cells by a blood priest who says that the old crow is dying. Clark continues to write in his journals, talking about when Manhunter told him a story about how Warworld came to be, but soon after they learned that story was untrue, and then Superman heard about how Warworld was built by the Mongols, but then today, he learned that was also a lie as well, as the prisons are taken deep into the planet. Clark discovers that Mongols built several imitation Warworlds, but nothing as large as this original one, and the true Warworld is a tangle of ruins structures built and repurposed by billions of different species, all building layer upon layer, and beneath all of that is the forgotten world of soil and stone. Clark knows that learning of this place, the idea of Warworld sustaining life makes sense as the prisoners are led to a chamber where a giant green glowing creature called Old Crow awaits them. Clark always thought that he knows the numbers of lives that were taken by Mongols over the years, but now he knows that it's been happening for thousands of years, and now they are celebrating another victory over an extinct race. He figures when the last member of a species dies, the Warzoons and Strays gather to honour its passing, but all for very different reasons, with the Warzoons celebrating dominance over that species, while the Strays do it because they see their own future there. He leaves the prisoner line to go to Old Crow, mourning it one final time as the creature's green glow dies off and the creature succumbs to death. Clark and the others are forced to push the creature into the pit below them while a blood priest screams a sermon about the old crows now joining the forever in the service of Warworld. Clark himself apologises to the creature, knowing that he was too late to help them and that his end came in a dark place with no loved ones to see it off. Clark promises that he will protect the others as he failed to protect it. The creature is cast into the pit where the waiting worms feast on it as Clark listens to the sermons, not really understanding the alien languages, but he does notice some familiar symbols on the wall, the same symbols from that of the Genesis fragment he found on Earth. He notices the blood priests can't actually read the runes either, pretending to read the dead language and reciting Mongol's propaganda instead. Clark intends to decipher the runes and use them to help free the people as later on Nat meets with Clark, telling him that she is now the smith's apprentice and she will now be able to make Clark better gear, showing him an S symbol piece of armour she made for him, knowing with the hits he keeps taking, he will need it. He picks up two sticks, throwing one at Krill and asking if he will teach him to fight like a war world. Elsewhere in the wastelands, some Warzoons spot a cart pulling up to them when suddenly they are all killed by Midnighter and his small gang of yellow aliens, who can't believe they actually killed a Warzoon and Mongol can't learn of this. Midnighter says that those Warzoons enslaved them and killed their families and they wanted to fight back, so they got to put on their big alien pants and do their jobs. They infiltrate the prison as the aliens ask who the prisoner on the throne below them is. Others know that there are too many Warzoons in the area and Midnighter agrees, knowing they can't break him out yet. The being they intend to break out is the one on the throne, and it is revealed to be Apollo, who Midnighter knows they will be getting him out of there soon enough. 